I'd like to call this meeting of the Zion City Council to order. Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Here. Commissioner McDowell? Here. Commissioner Deteen? Here. Commissioner Fisher? Here. Mayor Hill? Here. Uh, Pastor uh, Roberto C. Fuentes, please. Let us pray. Dear wise and loving Father, first let me say thank you on behalf of all who are gathered here today. Thank you for your abundant blessings. Thank you for the ability to be involved in useful work and for the honor of bearing appropriate responsibilities. Thank you for the loving for loving us. In the scriptures, you have said that citizens ought to obey the governing authorities since you have established those very authorities to promote peace, order, and justice. Therefore, I pray for our mayor, for the various levels of city officials, and for this assembled council. I am asking that you would graciously grant them wisdom to govern amid the conflicts, conflicting interests and issues of our times, a sense of welfare and true needs of our people, a thirst for justice and rightness, confidence in what is good and fitting, the ability to work together in harmony even when there is this honest disagreement, personal peace in their lives and joy in their task. I pray for the, for the agenda set before them today. Please give an assurance of what would please you and what would benefit those who live and work in the city of Zion. I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Um, item number three is a, pre a Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, I told Mr. Bremner that I was going to bring his name up, and he said he didn't do it. But I can uh, assure you that he did. And it was a couple of meetings ago. He made a presentation about the Pledge of Allegiance. and. Uh, I was guilty of it, and I think everybody else was, that we uh, rushed through it and say it very quickly. And uh, the last meeting, I tried to slow down, but everybody in the audience just took off ahead of me. So I'm going to ask that everybody stand and say the pledge and slow it down and think about what we're saying. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Item number four is agenda changes. Do any of the commissioners have any changes to the agenda? Hearing none, is there a motion to accept the agenda as presented? So moved. We have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Deteen? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item number five is citizens comments. The number of people signed up today. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Um, you all, I'm assuming everyone heard the uh, ground rules, so uh, I will uh, um, start with uh, Joe Roth. Thank you, Mayor, Harrell, Mayor Hill, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Joe Roth. I'm from the Illinois Association of Realtors and the Main Street Association of Realtors. And I'm here today to state our opposition to the home rule proposal you'll be considering uh, this evening. Um, Illinois Realtors is the only advocate for private property rights at the state capitol in Springfield and in village and city halls across the state. So we have firsthand experience with the unintended consequences of home rule. While well, we appreciate the budgetary challenges you face, we believe home rule presents too much of a risk to be a viable solution. So with this proposal, you'll be taking the authority that's currently reserved with the voters, and not only permitting this council, but future councils, the ability to levy a wide range of new taxes, create new rules, red tape, regulations, fees, and requirements that could limit private property rights. You'd have the ability to incur significant debt and all without the voter approval. Now, all of these have a very disproportionate impact and negative impact on property owners. We believe that you can come to a uh, resolution on your budgetary issues by providing a more explicit uh, tax levy to the voters rather than home rule. And that's what we would suggest. Thank you for your time, and I'll be happy to uh, be of assistance any way I can. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Next is Kathy Champagne. Hi, good evening. Kathy Champagne of Zion. I'm here for both resolutions of number seven. 
please, please do vote to support the enforcement of environmental regulations. I think it's really important. And, and I'm really glad that you have this on the agenda and are considering it. And the second is home rule. I'm in favor of home rule. I think that, well, I know I've come, been to your budget meetings and know how hard you guys have worked to balance the budget. And if you pass, I'd like you to send out a flyer to explain the advantages of home rule because it's not all about taxation. You can do rental inspections too. And there are other, other uh, flexibility with making laws that you're being held back on. And I realize in three years we may have home rule anyway after the census. Thank you for being proactive and bringing it up now. Thank you. Uh, Terry Boss Romero. I just wanted to bring up the issues regarding the flooding on my property. And I've been there 15 years. I've been dealing it with for 13. More money is coming out of my pocket to maintain vehicles, personal property. And the way I'm looking at it, we're paying more and more taxes for what? I'm not getting nothing from the city of Zion. City of Zion does nothing for me. They tell me, oh, it's an act of God. If it's your property, you're going to complain the same way. So something needs to be taken care of about this. Don't worry about, you know, money going for stuff that it doesn't need to go to. It needs to start going back into the taxpayers' properties so that we don't have to keep paying out of pocket. Because if we don't pay our property taxes, you take our property. So what's the point? What's the, what does Zion have to offer me to stay in Zion? I'm at the point I'm ready to go. I don't care no more. And that's how I look at it. Zion has nothing to keep me here. So it'd just be another homeowner that's been here for several years that walks away from Zion. So it's just a problem that needs to be addressed and taken care of. And as far as the budget for Zion, figure it out. I'm not the only one with the issue. Uh, Thank you. What is your address? 2003 20th Street. 2003 20th Street. And every time we call the park on the streets, now that Zion, big mistake, merging with Gurney. No, you can't. You can't park on the street. Where before we always could. Who gets up to tickets? We do. Yeah, they're dropped because nobody's, you know, forwarding everything so that Gurney handles the city of Zion the proper way. We're not in Gurney. I don't care about Gurney. That's their problem, not mine. But, you know, yeah, we get the tickets dropped, but the point is even the police departments aren't communicating with each other. So there's another point of why stay in Zion. There is no one. There's no reason. Thank you. Thank you. Ann Fitzgerald. I'm with her. Same, same problem. Okay. Yeah. Doug Orr. Good evening. My name is Doug Orr. I'm a resident of Zion. And I am just uh, speaking about uh, item 7A. I urge you to support the resolution for enforcement of environmental regulations on the Foxconn property. Wisconsin's talking about waiving or filling 26 acres of wetlands that feed into the Des Plaines River. We already have enough flooding issues on the Des Plaines and we don't need to make it worse by, by waiving environmental regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Denise Lear. Mayor Hill, thank you. My name is Denise Lear. I've been a resident of Zion for over 53 years. My main concern now is the housing, uh, housing issue in Zion. I am a renter, and I'd like to know from the police chief or someone, what happens in these apartments up here now when police are called, are the managers or anyone notified? I'm a senior citizen living in a building with a lot of Section 8 people. There is no kind of regulation on these people. They move in, and as a senior citizen who's been up here all these years, my life is being, you know, I feel threatened. It's the property values have gone down. Nobody's these inspections that they're supposedly doing to the properties. What are they inspecting? What's being done? Property values are going down. What's happening? So that's my main concern now. Are the apartment buildings here? I'm a, I'm a renter. I'm not a homeowner anymore in Zion. But I've right. been here for 53 years, and I don't want to leave Zion. Right. We have, um, in the last three years anywhere where it, excuse me anyway instituted uh, two ordinances the first is uh, rental property inspections and uh, we re we have uh, I'm trying to think we did I believe we did 4,000 inspections 
last year of uh, rental units, and if they don't pass, um, they are cited, and they are required to upgrade to pass the minimum uh, housing regulations that we have. Now, when they get fined, and I'm, I'm, uh, we're stuck on this, we don't know, quite know how to uh, answer all of it, we fine them, but a lot of people just ignore the fines, they don't pay us, and again, because we're not home rule, uh, we don't have the ability to go after uh, many of the people who are uh, renting and, and, in, and enforce the fines that we, that we do. But excuse my ignorance on some of the matters, but I understand the young lady said something about the rental inspections if the home were to pass. Is that an issue? If the home were to pass, there would be rental inspections <laughs> that would not only inspect the property, but the quality of the person renting the property? Making sure that the value yeah, of the property is not defaced or value go down for the owners? Right. And, and, and believe me, I, I have the same frustration you have. Um, when we started the rental inspection program, we notified every landlord in the city of Zion. And there were 400, 200, 250 or 400. There were, we filled the gym at Central Junior High. And no, well, very few people were there in support of this. And, um, I raised the point that uh, these properties are deteriorating. The people who are there aren't, uh, and not all of them, not certainly. Right. They, and, I, and I'm not just talking about Section 8. I'm just talking about we have a lot of out-of-town uh, yes. uh, landlords who don't have the same priority for keeping our housing in our community the way we would like it. And when I raised these points, they said, uh, that's a, uh, a tenant problem, and that's a problem for the city. And my response is, no, that's a landlord problem. And you should be checking and doing um, uh, reference checks on who comes in, what they were like in their previous place. Yes. And, but I, I can't, we can't force them to do that. One of the things that we have, uh, we, we were doing a, uh, what's the name of that, Chief? It's not crime free, it's, uh, it's, it's nuisance abatement. If we get, and I want to be sure I get this right, if we get three calls from the same resident, from the same address uh, in one year, uh, we have, and there, there, are, there are specific offenses that are included in this, um, and there are specific offenses that are excluded. Um, like if, if it's a domestic, where in, in a woman calls because she has a domestic going on, that, that doesn't count because okay. we don't want to throw her out of a place. But if we get three calls from that uh, address within, um, a one, 180 days. within 180 days, um, we will um, pull the uh, occupancy permit. Mayor, can I ask you a question? Since you're dealing with adults here, why must you wait for three calls within 180 days? And these are adults, these are not children you're dealing with. Because in order to um, get through the court system and enforce it, you, we, that's about the minimum that, uh, that uh, we would the maximum. Have a little more freedom if we were home rule right. and enforcing the nuisance abatement. Well, as I said, this is my first meeting, but this will not be my last. Thank you. <clears throat> Carla King. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and council people and citizens. Um, this is about the flooding, but I want to take it just a slightly different angle about um, uh, us not being able, some of us cannot insure our properties for flooding. They have turned this down because this is supposedly not a flood zone. Okay, so uh, with, that, with that in mind, um, I, uh, the, the subject of FEMA was brought. Okay, and have you guys investigated the possibility of soliciting monies from FEMA because of the situation, uh, or federal monies? Have we looked into uh, those uh, venues? Well, I, I, I will, I can just comment on something that I actually saw today, and it's a uh, FEMA grant program. And uh, a lot of the things that FEMA uh, provides money for is after the fact. But this is a grant program, and I uh, forward it to Mr. Nabel, the city administrator, and he will get on it. Um, it provides relief prior to flooding. 
So we are investigating those and we will be looking into that. And I just got that today. I haven't seen that program <coughs> prior to today. I have well, not seen it. But the reason why I mentioned, you, you got to get moving on this. And I understand that there, there's always constraints and we, we're going to have to think outside the box. And I fully understand that. But uh, a, a couple of years ago when we had the last big flood, they had to remove all of the siding from my home. That was almost $20,000, okay? Okay, that was outside. And then inside, I had a shrunk that I had made in Belgium, I'm, I'm ex-military, and $5,000 down the drain just that quick. I lost equally as much in my home, okay? And this is the, this recent flood was the fourth one since I've been here, okay? So, you know, I, like I said, I fully understand, I understand budgetary constraints and whatnot, okay? But I'm talking about black mold that affected my health, okay? So now we're having health issues. So because of the health issues, you can't ignore the flooding any further. We have to do something, okay? So in the future, myself and my neighbors, we're going to be you know, interacting with you to ensure that steps are being taken to resolve this because we can't afford it. We cannot afford this type of damage every three to four years or now it seems like it's gonna be coming every year, maybe several times within a year. I don't want to go over three minutes, but you know, but we need we need answers. We really do, and we need not only answers. We need action. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mick Jackson. Beverly is my guest. Yeah. So good. Um, good evening, Mayor. Oh, um, good evening, Council. Greetings, ladies. Um, I want to introduce you to our new library director, Mick Jacobson, oh, and ask you if you have library cards. Do you have library cards? Yes, I do. Okay, good. Is there anything right. that Yeah, I, I'm very happy to be in the community and helping out, and I've um, met some of you, and I look forward to working with all of you to improve design in any way I can help. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I'm a handwriting terrible. I read terrible. Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> Jacobson. <laughs> Mike Potwin. Yes. I live next door to um, Martinez Auto Repair on 173 in Gideon. And it's supposed to be an auto repair shop and it looks like a junkyard. The fences are coming down there's campers parked in the parking lot, and it, it's just terrible. Is that the one in the, as you go on the curve there? It's on the, it, it's on the right hand side. When you're coming, which, going which direction? When you're going north. Going, 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 going west. On 173. Go, go, when you go okay. west on 173, okay. it's on the right hand side. Gideon and 173. Right. It's terrible. Uh, my parents have lived there for 42 years, and it, it's just been a mess since that guy took over. Have, have you talked to the uh, Mr. Ionson at the building department? No, I haven't. Okay. Would you get with Mr. Ionson? Uh, Absolutely. He's responsible for that. Then, okay. Uh, and I'm also here about the flooding also. Okay. Okay? Thank you very much All for right, your time. Thank you. Amanda and James Root. Route. So we're also here about the flooding. We live in the four corners of that alley that has one manhole. So our garage gets hit the most. I just lost a brand new forty thousand dollar motorcycle over this over this flooding. And we were we were waist deep pulling the manhole cover off, try to get the water down further because no one was coming to help us. And I have pictures to prove her fence has been ruined, our garage has been ruined, the motorcycles are gone, and I have proof of all that. So I'm just, you know, this is not the first time, obviously. It's just, it's one of the worst. Okay. May I add, uh, my dad worked for the city of Zion until he retired, and I just want to know what happened to the street department because they used to, clean the streets. I don't see them clean the streets no more. Where is the manpower at? This is not something we should be doing 
having to take time after our busy day at work. And I travel for work, so I'm not home with my wife all the time to go out and pull the manhole covers off and clean our streets. This is I don't get paid for this. We pay our taxes. We are homeowners. And us as a community should not have, we should have our street department doing this because my dad used to do it for 25 years and I just don't know what happened. So the point is too on top of it, we're all four, we're, we have one manhole in our middle of our alley, one. And it gets clogged easily by any debris that's flying down the alley from 173, from the alley from Gideon, from the alley from Gabriel, from our little yard as well, and one little manhole. That's what fills up the alley, that fills up my garage, that fills up my neighbor's garage, that fills up the other neighbor's garage. And we're, sorry, like I work 12 hour shifts, so I come home and I have to clean out something and my garage is ruined. So my garage is all eaten up from that uh, flood as well. So that's all I have to say, I'm sorry. Thank you. I think that we're getting the message loud and clear and I, I would just uh, respond that the uh, your question about where's the manpower for the street department it's gone uh, we, we have laid them off uh, we are 14 police officers short right now we're I think seven public works people short right now um, and we still have a huge deficit uh, at, the, at, at this city and it didn't happen this hasn't happened overnight. This has happened for a long time, but um, we're we're short of we're short of people, and I I understand that. And and our position has been um, that we don't want to raise property taxes. And and I no I know. I mean, hang on, just l let me finish. We do not want to raise property taxes, and and the city of Zion. Uh, the city has not raised the property taxes, and if we have, it's been absolutely minimal in the last in the, in the five years that I've been involved with with city government. We are when you look at your tax bill, the city portion of your tax bill is about a, I think it's 12 percent or 11 percent of your taxes. So when your taxes are going up, it's not us. It is truly not us, and I will. I mean, I can. I'll t I can take your tax bill, and we can go back if somebody wants to come in, and I will trace this, this the increase that you're paying to the city over the last five or six years, and it's been minimal. But you you have to. I'm, there are other taxing bodies involved, and if the issue is taxes that you have, you need to talk to them. No, because I'm just it's more about the flooding. no, I know that I know no no I okay. but but the question has come up about where's the public works? We understand that the streets are in terrible shape. We understand that 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 we have flooding, but and and we've heard it loud and clear. Um, I, I I guarantee you that, and we'll be doing everything that we can that's within our ability to do, and we'll we'll work with you uh, on all this. But anyway, I'm going to go on to Bobby Williams is next. <laughs> Like everybody said, it's it's hard out there, man. And you talking about anybody when it flooded last week, me and her went out there with a pick. City got the lights on, stand at the alley, cops carrying everything floating. We went out there with a pick and put drains off and the water went down. Her basement flooded, her garage flooded, her motorcycle covered up to here. I mean, all we did was put the drains off and the water went down. And, and then you walk down the street, and the gutters got leaves, garbage. And you are you sure don't work? Get somebody ain't got no job. Just walk around and clean the leaves and gutters up before they stop flooding and go down the street. I mean, I ain't got no job. I clean the gutters and the corners and stuff. Give me a city truck, and pick it all up. I'll do it. I ain't, I ain't working. I cut grass, do roof, cut trees down, everything. That's the one ain't got no help. I'm right. Okay. Thank you. Well. Um, Reverend Marie Bryant. Good evening, Mayor Hill, Council. Good evening. And citizens. I'm Reverend Marie Bryant. I'm the pastor of Thomas Memorial Amy Church here in Zion, Illinois. And 
I came because I had questions about like with the lighting of the areas here in Zion. It's so dark that even when I drive at night, I have to actually cut my high beams on to see the sign of the streets. And also, like with the crimes and things that have been committed lately, you know, it's so dark, there's a lot going on. And I feel if the lighting was better, maybe we would see better. People would see things more, uh, they can be able to see and witness things when they happen. And then also, I believe there is a need for more cameras. There's too much crime going on in the city of Zion, and nobody know anything about what's going on. We've had shootings going on, we've had killings on, what is that, 30, 30, 30th Street, Ezekiel, in the alley, and it, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, there, these are things that could be rectified. Yes, we do have our officers that patrol, but sometimes it needs, we need more than that. The city I, needs more I, than I, that. I agree with you wholeheartedly, and one of the things that we're, we are, are trying to do is to get citizen participation in identifying the people who are committing the crimes. But we have people who get shot. They get shot, and they know who shot them, and they won't tell us. And and to ex and I, I and and yes, we yeah, we will again. We will do everything we can, and we are doing everything we can to keep the crime down. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's very very difficult when the people that are actually the victims of the crime won't help us identify the perpetrators. And it's so. I. I I understand exactly what you're saying, and, and I'll, we'll talk to the chief about uh, what we can do with uh, with cameras and, and public works. We'll talk about lighting and where we can right. put lights. And, and even my, my children's other grandmother, she was hit by a car. The lady that was ran over dead, that was my, ch my grandchildren's other grandmother that was killed. No one saw anything. No right. one could see anything. It was too dark. It was on Lewis Avenue? Mm -hmm. Right. Excuse me, Mary Hill, a lot of the streets, are, the trees have grown over so that you can't see the lights anymore. Yeah. You can't see anything. Our light don't even work in our alley. Okay. Did you, yeah. Does anybody know? I mean, did... Uh, yeah, yeah, and if, if there are lights up, give us a call. Well, I'm sure the police, I've seen them go to the alley before, but I mean, I'm sure they should be able to recognize that, right? Yeah. Uh, well, it, 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 it takes everybody. If the light's out, let us know. You know, the police officers are looking for, they're, 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 they've got other things on their minds. It's, that's not what they're doing. But that if, if, if anyway, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and we will okay. certainly look at it. And Thank I, you, Mayor. I, I just want to, I want to tell you, and I want to just be sure that you understand that, that we understand that we, we've got some problems with, with flooding, um, and uh, we will. We hope to work on it and building and everything. And I know lighting and blue light cameras. Those cameras will be. They they're very effective. They're very effective. Okay. So if, even if those people who witnessed the crime don't come forward, you'll see it on film. You'll see it in the camera. Mm -hmm. But I, I just pray that we can get things together and make things work out because Zion has always been as the citizens have stated in the past, have always been a peaceful place. Yes. I agree. And I, I mean, I've been here since 1976, and uh, I, I said that there's, we have about 2% of our population that's causing us problems. Uh, but 2 percent's a lot of people when you have about 25,000 people in town. Yes. So yeah. it's, it's something that we're working on. The police department's aware of it. We are aware of, our, of all the issues mm -hmm. that we have. And again, we'll we we'll do everything we can, and, and, and we will work with you. I've got names and addresses here, and um, we'll get you involved. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cameras. Yeah. Um, we do have some cameras in our business district. <coughs> um, just to let you know that we, we do monitor those 24-7. Um, yeah. Thank you. You want to call? Yes, Pastor, and I'm just piggybacking off of what she's saying, and it's even about the light. I'm, 
I'm a full-time Uber and Lyft driver. Sometimes I have to go through alleys. I have to go through things that Diane, and the lighting is ridiculous. Like she said, the trees are over. You can't see anything in Zion. And people are walking in black clothes. And I don't want to be one because I'm out sometimes late and I'm a woman going through an alley, going through wherever to pick <coughs> some of our citizens up here in Zion. And that we, I can't see. Okay. And I, I do wear glasses, so it's not because I can't see. You know, I, you know, and it's it's it it's became to be r ridiculous with the lighting and design, and it, with cameras, it, they won't even be effective if we don't have good lighting. You're not going to be able to see like you really need. To. Okay, commissioner. Yeah, I was just going to say. Well, uh, as I was listening to the city comments and uh, citizens comments and talking with some of the people in the city about some of the issues that we have one of the things I think is really really critical that the mayor said was that we have to speak up when we see things you see it at, uh, if you travel as much as I did in the past 30 years or so TSA is always say if you see something say something and when I'm talking to people out in the community one of the things that I'm hearing is that they are afraid they don't want to get involved and if we don't get involved, then that 2% of the city that is impacting our quality of lives will continue to impact them in a negative way. And we can't allow that to happen. There are more good people here that want Zion to be successful than there are the others. So we have to continue. These issues that we're having with the city, they're not, they're not created by the city, but if we don't hear your issues and you come forward like you're doing today, then we don't know uh, how to fix them or what's going on. So it's, a, it's important that we know that you've made the time and effort to come here. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is make sure when there is an issue that you know the person in that particular department, whether it's the police department, building department, public works, uh, that you can contact about those issues. Uh, this past weekend we had a cleanup day and you were talking about the cleaning of drains and one of the things that I've seen since I've been here my family's been here for 56 years is, is that some of the issues we have on some of the streets that don't have major flooding or the flooding all of the time is people drop things in the drains and they don't pick them up so one of the things that I've talked about on Facebook is for people in their own communities to police those areas instead of calling public works to go out if you see debris in the gutter clean it out before there's a flood during the fall uh, clean those issues out because I cleaned up an area on uh, 21st and Joanna on Saturday that full of leaves full of plastic bottles so if there's a flood that whole area that you're talking about gets flooded. I see it on 31st and Gideon. That's the area in which I live. And typically what's in those gutters, debris, plastic bottles. And sometimes it's not by on purpose. It's from garbage days. Uh, garbage flies around. So if we each take a little bit of time each day, all of us can make this city, city better by doing those little things in our community, whether it's on snow days, uh, how many of you think about cleaning out your cleaning out the area where your fire fire hydrant is when the snow plow comes and plows over it? I do that in front of my house uh, because there's how many houses around, and if one house burns down, probably they're all if there's a major fire. So we're asking you. We need help too in in the city. We don't have the resources that we once did, but if we all chip in together and do just a little bit. We can all make the city better, whether it's with the drains, we'll work on the flooding issues, and certainly uh, with the crime and all those things. We understand what, uh, what those issues are, and we are working at it as hard as we possibly can and looking at resources to help us. So thank you for your comments. Can I um, say something? Absolutely. Okay, now we have uh, people that get in trouble. Can't we use uh, some of those people to do community, community service hours? Right, we are. That work done? We do that. We get about uh, 20,000. 20,000 hours. 20,000 hours a year from uh, community service people. Uh, we have to have somebody with them. Uh, that's part of the, part of the uh, process. They, 
we can't bring people into into the city that are doing community service and let them wander around. There has to be supervision, and we get 20,000 hours. That's that's 10 full-time people a year, uh, and and it's it's not 10 people a year that are working full-time, but that's the equivalent of it. So we do that, uh, and we have to, we we pay to have the supervision there that that are with with those with the people that are doing the community service. So anyway, thank you for your, all your comments. Um, Oh, okay. In the city of Zion, truancy is not um, ever mm -hmm. enforced for our kids because the last, if truancy might be, be enforced, it might be a little uh, of the crime to go down with some of the younger kids. I, it, it's just, is that something that they stop? Because when I was growing up, they had truancy officers or truancy, at least it was it was enforced. Well, it's, it's my understanding that truancy officers are uh, hired by the school districts. Well, the Zion police officers do issue citations. The they do offer truant or truancy citations. But do you guys do issue them? Yeah, it's mostly enforced in the school. Um, they'll notify us actually of people who are truant. Mm -hmm. We work with the school to take the, them or their parents to court. Is there a, sorry, is there uh, a curfew? Curfew? Yes. And I think it's 10 30 and Zion, 11. For children under 18? 11 Okay, I'm going to move on now with the, for the rest of the meeting if I can. Uh, item number six is a consent agenda with the clerk to read the consent agenda. Approval of minutes of the regular meeting held on July 17th, 2018 at 7 p.m. Bills, vouchers 129795 <coughs> through 129. 922 drawn on Huntington National Bank, $1,351,764.27. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move to approve the consent agenda. No motion. Second. And a second. Is there a discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Um, you're all welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, but I, I'll give you one minute if you don't want to stay uh, just take an opportunity to you can this would be a good time to leave but if you're you're welcome to stay I just wanted to so. <coughs> Hi. Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, good to see you first. Okay, I'll, we'll, we will get with you. We, we will get with you. Okay. Want to call the meeting back to order, please? Item number seven is consider passing resolutions as follows 7A support enforcement of environmental regulations related to the Foxcom upstream development to be located within the, within the headwaters of the Des Plaines River per Mayor Hill. Um, I brought this, uh, this came to my attention from the uh, Lake County Municipal, or the Lake County Mayors, and um, I'm going to read the resolution so that you understand what we're talking about here. It says, whereas the state of Wisconsin recently passed legislation waiving environmental regulations for and providing various incentives to Foxcom slash upstream development, Foxcom upstream for the construction of manu manufacturing facilities within Racine County along the Wisconsin-Illinois border and the headwaters of the Des Plaines River. Whereas the action allows Foxcom upstream to fill 26 acres of wetlands with dredge material without an environmental impact study or input from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at, at a site that is in the headwaters of the Des Plaines River, resulting in detrimental impacts upon the people of and properties within the downstream, downstream areas, including areas within a downstream Lake County area that has already suffered billions of dollars in damage from flooding. Whereas the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency identified 51 areas in 22 states that do not meet air quality requirements for ozone and exempted Racine County, which is known to have heavily polluted air. If Racine County had been designated a non-attainment area by the EPA, it would have required Foxconn upstream to install stringent pollution control equipment. Whereas the commercial Foxconn upstream development will divert approximately 7 million gallons of water per day from Lake Michigan, a primary source of drinking water for residents of Lake County. 
whereas the Foxconn upstream development is expected to treat and return over 4 million gallons of water to Lake Michigan through the Racine Wastewater Treatment Plant. Whereas additional development and infrastructure improvements required to support Foxconn are likely to result in additional impervious pavements and filling of more wetlands. And whereas the actions to fast track the Foxconn upstream development will unilaterally impose negative impacts outside the political and geographical boundaries of Wisconsin. Now therefore, be it resolved by the Mayor and City Council of Zion, Lake County, Illinois, we urge and support the following. Number one, we urge our neighbors and counterparts in the state of Wisconsin to immediately reconsider any actions relative to the Foxconn upstream development that waive enforcement of or compliance with all applicable reg regulations and laws which can compromise the environmental integrity and resiliency of natural resources to the detriment of the people and property in Lake County. Number two, with regard to the Foxconn upstream project and any and all future development projects upstream of Lake County, we urge our local and state counterparts in Wisconsin and federal agency counterparts to uniformly apply and enforce all applicable regulations and laws as written without exemptions, waivers, or variances to ensure negative impacts are not imposed on the residents of downstream Lake County. Number three, we support the Illinois Attorney General, Illinois General Assembly, and Illinois agencies in taking whatever actions possible to protect Lake County and the state of Illinois against the loss of water resources, potential flooding, and other ecological impacts in this development. Number four, we fully support business development and recognize that many Lake County residents will be positively impacted by the, by the employment potential presented by Foxconn. Our objection is not to the evolvement of Foxconn, but rather to the negative impact it may have on our communities. And we number five, we support coordination and cooperation between the appropriate political and professional leaders in both Illinois and Wisconsin with the jurisdiction over and or interest in the Foxconn development in Racine and Kenosha counties, Wisconsin. Is there a motion? I'll move to approve. We have a motion okay. and a second. Is there a discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Deteen? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item number 7B, providing for and requiring the submission of a proposition of whether the city of Zion, Lake County, Illinois, shall become a home rule unit to the voters of said city at the general election to be held on 6th day of November 2018 per Mayor Hill. Um, you have a explanation of uh, home rule from uh, our attorney and what's required to have this put on the ballot. Um, and you also have a uh, resolution before you. Uh, is there a motion? I'll move to approve this resolution to place the question of home rule on the ballot November 28th. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? Um, I just have a few questions, Mayor. Uh, one of the things we had talked about is uh, limiting um, the ability, our home rule ability, to increase property taxes. But if I understand this memo uh, correctly, um, although we could enact another resolution, it wouldn't prevent future city councils from, from changing that. So I guess that's we don't actually have the ability to limit right. property taxes. Right. I, I, I would, uh, I've handed, uh, the commissioners have a, just a Q&A um, statement here, a question and answer statement on, on what home rule is and, and what it can mean. And I will read it and I'm going to read parts that are, may not make you happy and parts that may make you very happy. but. Uh, I'm just going to read, I'm not reading the entire thing. Um, I'll just read uh, certain things that I think explain it a little bit to everybody here. Prior to July 1, 1971, the effective date of the Illinois Constitution of 1970, Illinois municipalities were limited in their authority to regulate by what was commonly referred to as Dillon's Rule. Dillon's Rule provides that municipalities possess only those powers exp expressly granted powers incident to those expressly granted, and powers indispensable to the accomplishment of the declared objectives and purposes of the municipal corporation. Non-home rule communities are still required to operate under Dillon's rule, but with some additional authority offered by Section 7 of Article 7 of the Illinois Constitution. 
However, home rule municipalities have the power to self-govern -gov in areas that are uniquely local in nature. Therefore, home rule municipalities in Illinois have the ability to regulate on any subject that is of local concern, provided the regulation thereof is not limited or prohibited by federal or state statute or constitutional provision. In Illinois, the only exempt, ex exemptions to self-governance are if the General Assembly explicitly limits or prohibits the exercise of authority in a specific area, to incur debt payable from an ad valorem property tax receipts maturing more than 40 years from the time it is incurred, to define and provide for the punishment of felony, provide for imprisonment of over six months, licensing of revenue, imposing taxes measured by income, earnings, or upon occupations unless otherwise authorized by law, providing for officers their manner of selection in terms of office except as approved by referendum or otherwise authorized by law, or anything that may violate the provisions of the federal or state constitutions. And I'm going to skip some areas here, but this is, this is what's important and what we think will be uh, very helpful to us. Except that it's limited by this section, a home rule unit may exercise any power and perform any function pertaining to its government and affairs, including, but not limited to, the power to regulate for the protection of the public health, safety, morals, and welfare, and to license, to tax, and to incur debt. And the important thing that we're looking at here is the protection of public health, safety, morals, and welfare. Um, those are, that's the primary thing that we're talking about. It gives us a lot more um, authority in um, enforcing housing regulations, and it gives us, it will give us a lot more authority in nuisance abatement issues and uh, crime-free housing, and uh, it'll give us a lot, a lot more leeway in dealing with the 2% that we have in the community that doesn't want to get with the program. Um, there are, again, um, like I said, there's, there are certain things in here that you may not like to hear, uh, and, then what, and it, it does, it talks about to license, to tax, and to incur debt. Um, um, and then the, right below that it says, as the above language provides, a home rule unit may exercise any power and perform any function pertaining to its government and affairs. Besides the limitations listed above, the regulations must be a matter pertaining to the government and affairs of the municipality and not a matter of state or nationwide concern. Um, it is impossible to compile a complete list of ways that home rule powers can be used to the benefit of every community because new and innovative uses are continuously discovered. In addition, benefits of home rule are relative because what may be helpful or necessary for one municipality may not be helpful or necessary for another. Um, the ability to address the relative needs and concerns of the municipality is, in and of itself, a benefit of home rule. Um, so that's what we're talking about. That's why we're putting it on the ballot. It will be up to the citizens of Zion to um, decide whether they they want to do the they want to do home rule or not. And uh, but that's the, the basis for why we're presenting this. And uh, do we have a, we had a motion and a second? Okay. Is there further discussion? Yes, I'd just like to, to add. Um, I don't have the citation with me, but I read a very interesting report a few years ago. Uh, a professor is, did a study of home rule in Illinois as related to property taxes and found that actually home rule communities were not outside the range of normal property taxes for communities within Illinois. I read that also. And because and really what it comes down to, municipalities, the people on boards like this, they want to get reelected. So they're not skyrocketing people's property taxes willy-nilly. So just well, we live in the community too. And, yes, exactly. Uh, any increase in property taxes affect uh, all of us. And that's not something that I'm in favor of. Um, it looks like uh, if, we, if we pass the, uh, this is to, to put a referendum on the ballot. For yes. But we had talked about how um, this might be a, a source of revenue for us in terms of sales tax. Is that something we want to also state in the referendum we put on the ballot so that the taxpayers understand 
completely why we're we're seeking home rule at this time it has to be present the question can't be offered the the language that's included in the resolution is what's required I, I, I my my guess is that if we adopt this tonight there will be a number of community meetings uh, where we will explain what we hope to do and what we hope to accomplish and uh, that issue would certainly be explained at that time uh, so but I, I we can't put that on the ballot is there any benefit to having a referendum for home rule and also a referendum for sales tax on the same ballot that's what I brought up last week yeah I'm asking if there's any benefit to do that I at this point I don't think we can I don't think we have enough time to the, the cutoff is August 20th so is it cut off August, August 20th or August, August 20th, 20th is the cutoff August, August 21st is our next right. so uh, August 21st is the next one I think if we don't get home rule we would proceed with trying to get a, a sale I think I think that's what, what was uh, what was discussed if the, the home rule uh, issue would fail then we would go present a referendum in April uh, on the sales tax okay so um, a, a plan would be to if uh, we agree to put this statement on the ballot as a referendum then we would plan on having several community meetings where we would explain the reasons why we want to seek home rule yes and it's, it's my understanding uh, mr. Nabel that some of our neighboring communities are also looking at home rule Correct. Uh, went to Carver, I believe, just uh, announced they were going for it, and I'm hearing also Beach Park and Wandsworth are considering it as well. I don't know if that's been announced and made official yet, um, but it's something that they've been looking into because a lot of the same issues that we're having that um, we don't have authority to govern due to state statutes, they're having those same issues with um, their 2% and their rental issues and things of that nature. So. A lot of the communities in this area are seeing the benefit of, of getting some of these powers that go with home, home rule for crime-free housing, et cetera. Okay. Further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item 8 is considered passing ordinances as follows. 8A is granting a variance from section 102-203 of the Zion Municipal Code for a theater for the performing arts as position petitioned by Zion Benton Township High School District 126 per Director Ionson. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, the school is requesting a height variance for the stage law for the theater. They have two options they're looking at. The stage law with motorized equipment is at 55 feet, and the stage law with not motorized equipment is at 60 feet. The planning and zoning record of approval to not exceed 60 feet. Is there a motion? Uh, so move to grant the variance. Have a motion? Second. And a second. For discussion? Uh, there, there's, this I'm, is the second reading of it. This is, already yes, this is the second the reading. Uh, there has been some question about what's the city's uh, uh, participation in this. Is there city money going into this? There's no city money going into it. The only thing that we are involved in is granting the, the height variance. Uh, the height variance, I believe, uh, Mr. Ianson, was 30 feet? 35 feet is it, It's because the high school is, is in a residential zoned area, and the uh, variance would allow them to go no higher than 60 feet. With a lot here. And that's all we have to do with it. We're not, there's not a, a dime of the city of Zion's money going into it. So we have a motion and a second. Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item 8 feet, authorizing execution of agreement by and between the City of Zion and Fire Recovery Service for building services in connection with motor vehicle incidents and other emergency incidents per Chief Lewis. Thank you, Your Honor, Council. At a previous Council meeting, you approved an ordinance to utilize the services of fire recovery USA for billing of technical and special services performed by the Zion Fire and Rescue Department. Attached in your packet, you have the service agreement, which needs to be executed in order to fully align with fire services or fire recovery USA and initiate the process of billing. 
A um, couple things just to point out after legal review. If you were to look at page four of the service agreement, section 8.1 is a termination on notice. So any time we find this doesn't work, we have 30 days to terminate. Either party can do that. And then again, one other concern was section 9.2 on page five, which is confidential information. I'm going to follow up with Fire Cover USA and just verify the need to either add FOIA uh, ability to release information under FOIA and or <laughs> see if this, the way they have it written actually includes FOIA in there. Other than that, it was approved by our legal department and I ask for approval of the service agreement and to get it signed. I'll make that motion that we approve the service agreement with uh, Fire Recovery USA. You have a motion? Is there a second? Second. Yep, and a motion and a second. A discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Dutee? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item 9 is discussion, authorization, and approval. 9A is considered quote from North Shore Truck and Equipment Company for a replacement of dump body for the 2003 International Truck in the Public Works Department. For Director Roberts. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and Commissioners. Attached your, our two quotes to replace the dump body for 2003 International Truck. The dump body of this truck is in disrepair and needs to be replaced. The truck is essential for public works snow plowing and salting operations. The staff is requesting that the council approve and accept the lowest responsible proposal from North Shore Truck and Equipment Company in the amount of $10,500. The funding for this replacement is from the general fund and was factored into this year's fiscal budget. Motion. Move to approve. Motion. Second. And a second. Is there discussion? Please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Dutine? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item 9B is considered proposal for Christopher Burke Engineering for Professional Engineering Service for the Illinois 173 and 20th Street Drainage Analysis per Director Roberts. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and Commissioners. Attached is a proposal from Christopher Burke Engineering Professional Engineering Service Services for Illinois Route 173 and 20th Street drainage analysis. In the last five to ten years, residents within this city, in this area of the city, have experienced multiple flooding events. The study will provide the city with an analysis of the existing drainage system to determine the cause of the flooding and to develop a short-term and long-term drainage improvement. Alternatives to reduce the risk of flood, future flooding. Additionally, they will research for any possible alternative funding for potential flooding solutions. Staff is requesting approval to execute an agreement with Christopher Burke Engineering to perform these services for $33,000. Funding for this project will come from the water fund. I'm guessing there's not even going to be any discussion about this. <laughs> is there a motion? Move to approve. <coughs> second. And a second. We have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? Is this the area where yes. you live? Yes. 20th Street. Yep. Yeah, 21st, but might as well call it. Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Dutine? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Aye. Item 9C is consider resident billing for ambulance charges per Chief Lewis. Thank you, Your Honor. Council, in front of you, you have justification for both items C and D, and I'll just take them one at a time as they're listed on the agenda. So as you're probably aware, and we've discussed many times before, the cost of supporting EMS services has gradually increased over the years. The cost of meeting federal, state, and local mandates, coupled with increasing training requirements, rising costs of ambulances and equipment, as well as supplies, has put a strain on the operating budget. Our current ordinance places the burden of cost on non-residents, as well as the insurance carrier for residents. Currently, we do not bill residents for the balance not covered by Medicare, Medicaid, or insurance. Additionally, we regularly respond for non-emergency services such as invalid assist, which we do not recoup fees, although ambulance is taken out of service. Unfortunately, in an effort to maintain the level of EMS services currently provided, we're in need of additional revenue sources. Uh, the first thing I'm recommending, which is the resident billing for ambulance charges, according to our ambulance billing vendor, Andres, our rates or at the level in which insurance companies will most likely pay out based on usual and customary service rates. But in an effort to reduce the strain on our operating costs, I've attached a revised ordinance which will allow 
Andre's medical billing to seek reimbursement from residents using utilizing our services in the same manner as they do for now. But I'm looking for approval to move forward with resident billing for ambulance charges. Is there a motion? I'll make that motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? A second. <clears throat> In a second. Is there a discussion? Well, I'll lead some discussion now. Uh, Chief, what, what do we charge for uh, uh, an ambulance uh, transport? Uh, it depends whether it's a BLS, Advanced Level 1, or Advanced Level 2. So a BLS is $1,400. And advanced level one is 16, advanced level two is $1,800, and then we charge $20 per mile. And so, um, how much does Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, insurance generally pay? Um, it depends. So, if Medicare is the only insurance company or the only insurance provider, I don't have a percentage breakdown, but I can tell you, for instance, on an ALS2 call, uh, the current rates that just came out for Medicare, Medicaid is somewhere around $300. Mileage is somewhere around $5. And mileage is typically pick up the hospital. That is, this is Medicaid or Medicare? Medicare and Medicaid. They do, they pay $300? Typically. It changes year to year. There's a sliding scale that Medicare puts out depending on your county and your state. Okay, and a private insurance company, health insurance, what would they pay? Uh, typically for our rates, they're paying the whole rate. Okay. So, okay, and and we do we do not bill if somebody right now if somebody a resident has an ambulance service and we bill Medicare or Medicaid or their insurance and they don't pay the whole thing, they are not billed. Because I've been told that they have been billed. And they have been billed in the past, probably up to five years ago. Five years ago. About five okay. years ago, we did bill. Well, we we billed them. We did not send them the collections, so they would get an invoice. They don't pay it. They get a second invoice. They don't pay it. Andre's medical billing just dropped the charge. So if you were aware of our policy, you might not pay it. Correct. But if you're not aware of our policy, you might pay it. So Correct. some people pay and some people don't, and we don't care. I shouldn't say we don't care. I don't mean. Yeah. The, the problem that there would, be, was, there would be no consequences. Correct. Right. The problem that would incur with that is someone would call. I thought residents didn't get billed. No. Here's the process. Oh. And so now, once you're aware of it. Right. But somebody who doesn't call, they get the bill. They. they there are people that would say, Oh my gosh. I owe this money. Probably. Okay. Well, I'm going to vote against it. I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the effort on increasing revenue for the city, but I just don't think uh, this is the way to do it. And uh, that's my comments. I wonder if there could be a, a compromise to this approach, um, just because. Uh, I've, I've talked with the chief about the, the number of service calls that we have, which are in the neighborhood of 4,000 a year. 4,300. 4,300 a year. You probably have, what, 4,300? 23 or something like that? Uh, 4,313 was last year's number, I believe. So it's quite a few. Um, and uh, about half of those, chief, you can correct me if I'm wrong, are um, EMS calls. Uh, probably a little bit more, probably about 80%. Um, all right, so 80% of those are EMS calls. And what percentage would be um, for things like sore throat? Um, uh, I couldn't give you those numbers without running a report. Um, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to accurately come up with a percentage without running a report. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a fair, well, these guys all walking in can tell you there's a fair amount of calls we run on them that are probably not emergent got to fix right now. You know. that, that could be treated at a, a, a walk-in clinic or, or something like that. Sure. So yep. it, it takes a lot of our time and um, manpower. I think that's one of the reasons why we have this proposal. Um, what would you think if we uh, only build if there was more than one call to a resident 
for uh, a similar issue. That could become a billing nightmare on the okay. end of the billing uh, event. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to track down. And they pull our records right off of uh, our software. Okay. So they would now have to track first time, second time. If, if and you can correct me if this is incorrect, but as far as a lot of times we don't know the results of that transport either, where someone may go in for a headache and you go, well, that's nothing. It could be a headache. It could be an aneurysm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we, we might not know the end result once the transport is done to be able to follow up then and say this was emergent or this was not or um, or what's emergent to me may not be emergent to you I mean that, that's the stuff we deal with every day we see a lot of stuff to some of us it's well I would have driven myself to the hospital and other people are I need an ambulance ride to the hospital some people certainly do use it because they know an ambulance ride to the hospital is a guaranteed it used to be it's still pretty close to a guaranteed I'm going right into the ER you know, versus sitting in a waiting room for three hours to go in for a cut finger. It's just kind of the name of healthcare nowadays and games that are played. I, I appreciate your concern. Uh, I don't want to build residents either for it. Are we going to build every resident? We every bill every resident no different than we do for a non-resident. And we're going to bill every resident every time. There are going to be no exceptions. Correct. And are we going to bill city employees? We can bill city employees. I mean, the city employee thing well, is better. Wait, wait, wait. wait. There, we, had, we had a discussion about this at the last meeting. I, wanted, I need to clarify that. We were self-insured before. So if we build city employees, the city, the, the, the city paid the fire department. So it's well. The city paid the city. So it, it, if a city employee were transferred, they weren't billed because our insurance company were self-insured, and so we would pay ourselves. Sure. Um, but we're no longer self-insured. So then uh, I'm assuming that we're going to bill all city employees. I mean, that, that's been in place for 30 years. There's nothing in writing that says you do that. There's nothing that says we can't turn around and say no. It isn't like that anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't. I, I, I don't know, like. Well, I mean, th this was just uh, another uh, source of revenue that we were looking at um, because of our budget deficit. Uh, I, I think the way this budget is presented and what we're proposing with Home Rule might uh, alleviate the need to do this billing. Um, if we find that uh, Home Rule doesn't pass and we don't have the ability to uh, get uh, the revenue that we need to sustain our services, then we might have to, to bring this up uh, again. And, and, and I agree with you on that. I think that the public needs to know that um, if we are unable to <clears throat> provide additional funding, our services, as meager as they are right now, when we talk about, and I'm, I, I, this is no, I'm not, this is no reflection on the department heads, but our streets and our our water and, and, and just some of the things that we're falling short on right now, they're gonna be a lot shorter uh, because we're looking at a, a million dollar deficit right now and we have to come up, we have, we have one more year that we, we can cover that deficit. But after that, that million dollar deficit is gonna go to next year. And if we don't address it, um, our services are gonna be cut by a million dollars a year. So. I agree with you that I, I, have, I, have, I have trouble with this right now. Uh, if, if we get to the point where we have no choice, then uh, I guess well, I would absolutely consider it. And, and for what it's worth, I can't say that I agree 100% with every fee that I bring forth either. I've grown up in the fire service, and that's what we are, a public service entity. But unfortunately, we're getting to the point where we can't provide the public service if we don't have. And so I do struggle oftentimes when we're going to say, let's bill somebody for something that we're supposed to be doing because that's our job. But to maintain those jobs and maintain those ambulances and maintain everything we do. And we're not the only people doing this. I mean, across the country, this is what the fire service has gotten into the EMS business. And this is what's happening to justify everything. Everybody's got to change the way we've operated. And it is what it is sometimes. We have a motion to approve it uh, on the floor in a second. Um, is there further discussion? 
Clerk, please call the roll. If you vote yes, you're approving it. I'm just want to make sure everybody understands that. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? I vote no. Commissioner Dettine? No. Commissioner Fisher? No. Mayor Hill? No. Item 9D is considered non-emergency special services for Chief Lewis. Thank you again, Your Honor. And this just follows up on everything else we've discussed and kind of ties into what Commissioner McDowell talked about some of our calls. We have a, a number of, and an increasing number of what we call invalid assist, and I'm gonna call those special service calls that are non-emergency calls, as well as a misuse by a limited number of residents who've resisted addressing their in-home health care issues using the fire department to resolve these problems. And this basically falls into people that are moving from a wheelchair to a chair, wheelchair to a bed, wheelchair to a car, wheelchair out of the house, they don't have a ramp, so they call us, call us to assist them with that move. That takes a 911 ambulance out of service to assist with the move. Um, it's usually not a problem when we do one or two, someone's new to a wheelchair, but what ends up happening is we get people that just don't feel a need to get a caretaker, family doesn't want to be trained in it, they live alone and they start calling us. And so we repeatedly go. So as an example, in 2017, we went to one address 14 times for an invalid assist. This does not generate any revenue. We're simply going over there and either picking somebody who slipped out of their wheelchair off the floor back into their wheelchair. We might be moving them from one spot to the other, but it's simply a move. We had one address with 14 calls, one address with 11, one address with nine, one address with eight, Two addresses that had five calls each, three addresses with four calls each, and three addresses with three calls each. So this was, uh, the 12 addresses accounted for 68 calls, or 51% of all our invalid assists. So what I'm proposing is something that I've seen several other communities in our area do, where we start charging for invalid assists after the third call. So your first three are free. If we gotta go over there four, five, and six, we're gonna start charging $150 each time. If we go over there, seven, eight, nine, it's gonna be $300 each time. If we have to go over there 10 or more times for the same person, then we're gonna charge $500 for each time. So this, this is copied right off of the same ordinance that several communities are using. Um, the goal here is either to, what, well, what the primary goal here is to simply reduce the number of times we're called just because we're there. And this goes back again, we're here for a service, I get it, but we have residents that tend to abuse the service a little bit rather than going out and saying, okay, I need home health care. I need a full-time person here, or I need to be in a nursing home or an assisted living center. Instead, they're using the fire department sometimes as a crutch. So I'm looking to implement an ordinance that includes the charges I identified and are listed in your packet. All right, I'm gonna make a motion that we uh uh, Chief's recommendation for non-emergency special services and uh, charge as delineated um, in this ordinance. And I'm going to vote yes on it. <laughs> Is there a second? I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? I've got a couple questions. Um, how are you going to, have you addressed the, how are you going to administer this? Yeah, what we do is in our software, we just keep track and what we do is we run a report. So we can run a report on an address based on the invalid assist. And if we get that second address in a 12 month period, we just keep a tally and it just runs that. Same way we do fire alarm billing. Right? Okay, <coughs> would, would, would you uh, add something to that, to something in a neighborhood of, uh, on the second call, uh, hand them a piece of paper that explains what the policy is and what the charges would be for the yeah, we fourth, can do that on the first fourth, call. We fifth, do that sixth. right now for our fire okay. alarm billing. We okay. could certainly do that same thing with ambulance calls. Okay. The guys typically when they go over, they have to fill out a form anyways that says we were there, we took care of you, and you're not going to the hospital. We can certainly have that just added to the pack. Yeah, I just and just have them initial the thing that we give them and get a, I don't know, get a copy of it or have two so that we have it documented that they were made aware of what our policy is so that. When, if they start screaming about, I didn't know about this, uh, we will we'll have documentation. 
Um, we have a motion and a second. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Dettine? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mayor Hill? Aye. Item 9E is considered approving general fund budget for fiscal year May 1, 2018 through April 30th, 2019 for Administrator Nabler. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm not going to rehash this whole budget because we've done that many times over the past couple, uh, couple of months. But everything that you have before you, this is general fund only. The, re the remainder of all the special revenue funds and other funds will be coming on the next meeting for uh, review and approval. But um, everything in, in here is as it was presented at the last budget workshops. The only change is on page two, uh, where we have a about halfway down transfer from the water and sewer fund. We added uh, a million sixty thousand to that based on the results of our last budget workshop to transfer funds from the water and sewer fund to cover us to May 1st um, while we continue to come up with a plan to uh, implement as soon as possible or sooner to address the deficit going forward because as the mayor said this is not something that's going to go away for next year this is just buying time for the current year until we can either get home rule uh, sales tax referendum or alternative solutions uh, in place so I recommend approval of the general fund budget as presented for the current fiscal year ending April 30th, 2019. Um, I just asked the legal counsel if there's anything that we need to do to um, ensure that the, the money uh, would eventually get at first opportunity get paid back to the water fund. And uh, she said that there would be a resolution, uh, if this is approved tonight, there'll be a resolution that would transfer the money in, and that that, that Set up the repayment term. there would be a repayment term in the resolution that it is going to be repaid to the law. That resolution will be passed tonight? No. 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 Not next week. Yes, next week. <clears throat> is there a motion on the budget? I'll move to approve the budget as presented. We have a motion? Second. And a second. Is there a discussion? Basically, not to sugarcoat it, but we'd run out of money somewhere around end of January, early February without transferring funds over. Right. So basically, the November ballot will, Correct. will be the cutoff. That'll be the deciding factor on implementation of whatever plans going forward. Uh, we wouldn't be able to last uh, financially into the, the April ballot then. Or if, if, if the home rule does not pass and uh, we don't have any other revenue source, we probably wouldn't be able to last till the uh, April ballot with a tax referendum. Not without transferring funds or issuing other debt. Um, my, my concern, and I mentioned this at the last budget workshop, is if we didn't have a plan in place at the November results, I don't want to wait until April for a sales tax referendum because if all the eggs are in that basket and it doesn't pass, you are now at a point where you're out of money and you have two weeks before you need to implement some plan to address the deficit. Yeah. Um, and that's not, you're in crisis mode at that point. You're going to make decisions that drastically affect services, uh, potentially negatively in the wrong direction because you're, you're rushing at that point rather than planning it out now for that time. Okay. Commissioner, I, I, I think your questions are absolutely to the point. And I think Mr. Nabel's response was absolutely to the point that um, I, I, I want to explain to, to citizens that when, when you look at our tax bill, um, in order for the, well, well, you guys have heard this and you've heard this, that I've been highly criticized for bringing in gaming to Zion. 
Well, the gaming's bringing about $200,000 a year into the city, just for the city alone. And if you figure out the numbers and take it from two, $200,000 and figure it all out, the expansion of the hospital, the city got about $250,000 in, in new taxes from the hospital. And they're paying everything they're supposed to pay. They're not getting any break from anybody on their taxes. So we have to get another expansion of the hospital in order for us to get $250,000. And that's why there has been an emphasis on my part and where I have been putting my efforts on trying to get this medical marijuana cultivation thing going. That's in the courts, but that could be tremendous revenue for Zion in the future and the nuclear spent fuel rods. For us to think that we're going to be able to solve our problem by, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not being flippant, but by putting a business in the, in the closed Dairy Queen, we're, we're, we're kidding ourselves. So, and, and I think that, that the point that, that I heard being made by both Commissioner and Mr. Nabel is that the, the medical marijuana thing hasn't come through, the spent fuel rods haven't come through, we're gonna keep working at them, we're gonna keep pushing those boulders up the hill, but there's no guarantee that we're going to be a home rule community and there's no guarantee that if that doesn't work there's no guarantee that there would be a sales tax increase approved so we have to make we have to be ready to make some adjustments and some plans because we have to be we have to pay our we have to pay salaries and we have to pay our bills and the only way to do that is with a balanced budget and this isn't a balanced budget because we're taking, we're borrowing money from the water fund. Now we're borrowing money from the water fund because we won't have to pay interest on it. If we issue tax anticipation warrants, we would have to pay interest on it. And what was our other possible? Bond. Uh, Bond. Yeah, issue bonds, uh, but issuing bonds to um, cover your operating expenses is crazy. That's like, that's like taking out a loan, uh, a, you know, a hundred thousand dollar loan so you can cover your expenses for a year because you can't, cover your expenses and then when you get to that you got to pay the loan back plus your expenses so those things aren't they're they're not going to work so we have to come up with a way to balance the budget and it's it's and again and I'm I'm going on and on and on here but this is not this council's fault there were decisions made like issuing bonds to pay operating expenses by a previous administration there were just some bad decisions made and we're stuck with it and we're trying to dig ourselves out and we will continue to try and do that but uh, we're just we're 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 in a mess uh, so your point your question is well taken and, and mr. Nabel your response was direct and to the point so is there a, we have a motion in a second we have a motion in a second is there further discussion clerk please call the roll Commissioner McKinney? aye Commissioner McDowell aye Commissioner Mateen? Uh, item 10 is departmental commentary. Department heads have anything that they would like to add? Do you want to? Do you want to say something? Did I? Yeah, you did. But I can't remember what it was. <laughs> and we were in the same club then. <laughs> I can't remember it either. <laughs> yeah, I'm a lot older than you, so I have an excuse. Uh, okay. Uh, announce uh, item number 11 is announcements. August 21st at 6:30 p.m. is at 6.15. 6.15 p.m. Zion Township Board meeting and uh, 7 o'clock is the Zion City Council meeting. I've got another announcement if you don't okay. mind. No, yes, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, a few meetings ago we had um, uh, citizens' comments related to our, our kennel um, and our animal control. And um, I'd just like to say that we've had meetings with those that uh, were concerned about our treatment of animals and we've been working together with them, and that's resulted in us having a work day down at the kennel uh, this Saturday, August 11th, at 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, everyone is invited to come and help us uh, clean up the kennel area. Uh, that's in connection with the Zion Cleanup Day, so there are some precincts that are going to be cleaned up if 
if that pushes through? Well, actually, that, that the cleanup day for August 11th, uh, talking with our economic development director, Santa Lita Bronson, uh, is, isn't on Saturday, this Saturday. So we'll be able to divert all our resources to the oh. animal control facility. So everybody is invited down to the kennel to help us uh, paint. And we're going to clean up the outside kennel area. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm just pleased with uh, how a complaint that came to the city council uh, was resolved favorably, and now those that were concerned are working together to uh, make it a better place. Thank you. Okay. Item 12 is uh, closed session pursuant to 5 ILCS 120 slash 2 open meetings for discussion of pending litigation and collective bargaining. Is there a motion to uh, go into closed session? So moved. A motion? Second. And a second. Any discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner McKinney? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Dutine? Commissioner, Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Aye. And there will be no. Uh, there will be no action taken on anything that's discussed in closed session. Uh, the only thing that we'll do when we get out of closed session is adjourn. Thank you.